Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verses 12 to 22. That's Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 22. And now, Israel, what does the Lord ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. <clears throat> and you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is the one you praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were 70 in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. You likely have heard over the last few weeks a great deal about refugees. The commitment of the Canadian government to bring in 25,000 by the end of the year. The commitment uh, by the Democrats in the United States to bring in uh, an even greater number than that into the United, you know, into the U.S. and the commitment by the Republicans to say no, they're not. And if you have been reading uh, part of this discussion on Facebook, uh, you probably find yourself kind of want to slap your head or you slap your computer, and maybe slap a few people on the other side of the computer, <laughs> because it's really frustrating. You know, listening to the thinking and to the attitudes, especially on the part of people who are supposed to be Christians, uh, as this discussion is going on. Uh, I've got to confess, I didn't tell the people involved, but I got so frustrated that I unfriended a couple of people this week uh, because I just found their statements to be just so far from any biblical uh, base. And these are people who are supposed to be Christians. And I thought, okay, well, I think this is time to do a lesson, to, to think about this from a biblical perspective. And I want to begin with a discussion that we're familiar with from Luke chapter 10. That is what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. But I want to spend my time basically on, on kind of the setup and the point of that. All right, so in Luke 10, 25 to 37, we read about how an expert in the law comes up to Jesus and asks him the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, that sounds like a reasonable question. You recognize there are different reasons people ask questions, sometimes because they're genuinely interested, sometimes because they, they want what they're asking about, and sometimes they're looking for a, a, a way to create and raise an issue to find something they can object to. And so when this teacher of the law asks this question, Jesus says, well, you, you know the law, and repeats the great commands. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, and the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. These were the two great commands of the Mosaic Covenant, that everything really is summed up. I mean, you think about the Ten Commandments. You can break them down into those commands that relate to honoring God and those commands related to how we treat other people. This is not new ground. This is something that an expert in the law would be very familiar with. And probably that's demonstrated by the question that he comes up with next. Luke tells us that this man is seeking to justify himself. That means 
that he's not looking for the answer. He's looking for a way to get out of what he knows the answer is. That's what justifying yourself is about. And so he asked, well, who's my neighbor? Practical living over the centuries have kind of evolved the definition of neighbor into the person who is just like me. And you can understand, in the first century context, You know, you have the teachers of the law, you have the priests, you have the ordinary people, you have the more fanatical people like the zealots, you have the Romans, you have the Greeks, you have the Samaritans, you have the other nations who would be around. So from the practical standpoint, it has evolved into the idea that a neighbor is somebody who's just like me. Jesus knows that. And so he wants to create, and I'm calling it a big rethink here. You know, sometimes we have to stop and sit back and really think something through. Something that we have accepted as true all of our lives Something that everybody around us accepts is true, but may not be true. And so Jesus has to put this into a form that he can understand. So Jesus tells a story, a parable. And in that story, there are the main characters. There is a man who was walking along the road who was robbed and left for dead. There's the priest who comes by, walks by on the other side of the road. I don't want to get involved. Might be a trap. Whatever. Might make me unclean for service in the temple. And so he goes by. Next comes the Levite. Same thing. I don't want to get involved. There's too many problems. It's too dangerous. You might ask, well, why is it dangerous? Well, the guy's robbed there. Maybe he's, maybe he's the trap. You know? I mean, you know, one of the things that happens is when people are dealing with issues, they start running on their fears, right? Don't they? And the fears kind of take over everything and exclude reason or even scripture. So along comes a Samaritan. Third man in Jesus' story. I've said this before, and what it kind of reminds me of is that when the the Jewish people, you know, at the Feast of Purim, read the story of Esther, that what they do is when when the name Haman is mentioned, they, they, you know, it's it's like, you know, and, and some of us will remember back when you go to a movie and there'd be the villain that would be up there and everybody in the audience would start booing and hissing at the, at the villain. And in the crowd that Jesus is speaking to, you can kind of expect that when he mentions the Samaritan coming by, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were people in the crowd that thought, uh, you know, kind of their own way that they thought Jesus would be going with this, and the Samaritan would come and check the guy's purse and make sure that the robbers got everything. You know, the Samaritans were not good people to the Jewish thinking. So why did Jesus use a Samaritan? Well, there's a tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. And we're not going to get into the backstory here, but they're somehow related, but they're not related. And you know how family, distant family, sometimes doesn't get along? That the issues between the Jew and the Samaritan are pretty strong, including religious differences. Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, tells us there was actual violence between the Jews and the Samaritans. And that's believable because at one point Jesus was traveling toward Jerusalem, 
approaching a Samaritan village, the people won't let him come, even come into town. And the apostles say, hey, let's call down fire and let's just blow this place off the map. That's Turner's loose rendition, but that's the point of it. Nobody would miss some bunch of Samaritans. And so these are, to the Jewish audience, the Samaritan would be really almost the terrorist of the first century. They're politically and racially corrupt. Yet Jesus wants to use the Samaritan to show how broad the definition of neighbor really is in God's thinking. We know in human thinking, it's very narrow. It's somebody just like me, and it's still true, isn't it? So, we just read Deuteronomy 10. This is part of the law. You know, this man who's an expert in the law should know these verses. And let's just kind of go through these very quickly to highlight them. So, verse 12 begins, what does the Lord ask of you? You know, I always love those statements that, that you get in, in presentations of, of the law. Sometimes the prophets will say this. You know, it's, it means it's going to be a summary. It's going to be a highlight. It's going to get the, the points that God really wants them to know. All right, and, and look at just how this begins. Fear the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Love him. Serve him with all your heart and soul. Observe the commands and decrees I am giving you for your own good. And, you know, I always think about the fact that the, the expansion of thought here on this one is really interesting. Observe the commands, the commands and decrees I'm giving you for your own good. You know, why does God give his word? Why does he teach people to do what he does? It's because we need to know what's right so that we can find the good and enjoy the good. You know, it's for our welfare that he tells us this. And so, verse 14 begins a, a reminder of who the Lord is. And, and there's more than that than, than verse 14. But I want, I want you to just look at verse 14. Uh, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. Uh, then go down to 17. The Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. Who, who's God? <laughs> he is unique in all the creation. He is the creator. He is the one who has all authority. He is the one who has all power. So when you're talking about being in a covenant relationship with him, it's going to begin with the idea of knowing who and where God is and knowing I'm not God. That's kind of an issue that human beings have with him. But that then what Moses is saying here is that what God wants is rooted in who he is and what he has done. I always like the idea of thinking it in terms of God is not asking of human beings what God has not already given or done himself. All right. So Moses speaks of God's love. He chose, he loved Israel. It wasn't because of the greatness of the nation. In fact, you notice the last verse that only 70 people went down into Egypt 
that's not a very big nation. <laughs> you know, if you, if you were listening to the news and the, the newscaster was saying, well, you know, that, that, that we have found a new nation. It has 70 people. We were kind of like, huh? That's not a nation. That's a mob. So it wasn't because of their size or their strength or their prestige or prominence in the world. But God in His grace chose this, I'll use the term mob, this big extended family to create a nation. He says, God does not show partiality. He doesn't take bribes. You know, He's not going to going to show favoritism to one person or one nation over another that even though he's chosen one God's concerned about the welfare of all nations and that comes in a little bit later God defends the fatherless and the widows and whenever we study in in our our Bible studies we talk about the biblical concept of of justice in the Old Testament is how the prophets are calling for fair and just treatment of those who are disadvantaged, those who are poor, those who need support and help. And it's people like the orphans, the fatherless, the widows. People who may not have anybody to stand up for them or to support them or to help them. That God in his welfare is concerned about the poorest people. But then next... He loves the alien, or the one that uh, was, was part of the reading, uh, the foreigner, the, the person who is not native-born in that culture. And God provides food and clothing for them. Even the people who were not part of Israel were in his love. And his concern. And so Moses says here, you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. He wants to remind them that the fact that they were chosen was despite the fact that they were essentially homeless. Why did Israel go to Egypt? Because they were refugees from famine. Why did they leave Egypt? Because they were refugees from oppression. I don't know if you've ever used that word thinking about Israel and its history, but they were refugees. They were looking for refuge. They, They left the famine to go down to Egypt with the help of Joseph and Pharaoh because there was no food where they lived. But then, many, many years later, they had been oppressed. They were slaves. They needed to get out of where they were because they were being abused and mistreated and literally murdered where they were. And so God sent Moses to lead them out of Egypt. That's what refugees are. There are people who leave their home because of oppression or disaster to try to find another place to go, another place to live where they can be safe and they can find the needs and the fulfillment of those needs that they don't have. The New Testament takes a a similar view here. Peter, in 1 Peter 2.11, refers to us, refers to us as Christians, as aliens and strangers in the world. Why? Because we live in an environment, we live in cultures that are hostile and different from the values that we have as God's people. That's why we get frustrated so sometimes with what's going on in the world around us. And so as the people of Israel 
were, were to remember the fact that they were, they were aliens, they were foreigners, as they moved around, Peter says, Christians, we, we need to remember that we are aliens and strangers here. And so while we're living here in the world, we need to live such good lives among the pagans, literally the nations, that they can see your good deeds and glorify God. That what they're supposed to see in us is that even if we are in a hostile, threatening situation, that our faith and our life and our values, our principles of living for good, come through. There are so many passages we could look at, but I'm just going to touch a few. Number one, how about Jesus talking about the, the parable of the sheep and goats? Talking about God making, a, in the judgment, a distinction between the, the, the sheep and the goats, and the goats being those people who didn't look after human beings in need, who didn't look after suffering, who didn't look after hungry, who didn't look after nakedness, versus the sheep that will be welcomed into his kingdom because they did. And he said, the sheep will say, when did we do this? And Jesus would say, as much as you did this to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus takes service to the needy, to the foreigner, to the alien, to the refugee, personally. Paul tells the Galatians, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to everyone, to all. I had to, you know, kind of pound my head this week as I, as I saw discussions, people posting on Facebook, and, and somebody went to the story of the Good Samaritan and making other points from the, from the Bible about caring for those in need and other people would respond and say accept refugees really you think that's a biblical idea i liked one where they had jesus telling the story of the good samaritan in response to this this lawyer And making the point about, you know, at the, at the end of it, about which, uh, you know, go and do likewise. And kind of a mythical person saying, yeah, but, but what about the refugees? And they had Jesus saying, okay, you didn't get it. Let's do it again. And starts telling the story all over again. You know what it comes down to is people don't want to care for people who are in need because they don't want to. They're not willing to. They don't care enough about other people. They don't love. They're not like Jesus. Paul told the Romans, now I want you to think about this. This is the church. These are the Christians who live in the capital of the pagan Roman Empire. These are the people that are going to be responsible for the death of many, many Christians over the years to follow. These are the people that, are, that have driven Christians out of Rome violently. And Paul says... As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You know, the role of the Christian in the world is, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We are the people that God has commissioned to be light in a dark world, to be help in a hurting world to bring forgiveness and love 
to the hatred and the violence of humanity. Yeah, it's a very, very scary role God has given us, isn't it? But do you know a better way for the world to heal than through the love of Jesus and through the lives and the examples of Christians? So when you hear somebody say or write that somehow they think refugees should be excluded from our care and our concern, understand that that person doesn't understand. They don't know the love of God. And maybe what we need to do is to share with that person what God's word really says. Let's stand as we sing our closing song.